in our Bible reading, we are going to complete, we're going to complete the book of Deuteronomy. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the fifth book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yes, I knew there were five of them. We're, I thought I had too many fingers there for a minute. The books of Moses will be behind, will be behind us. The Torah, the Pentateuch, the law. And tomorrow we're going to read about the death of Moses and his burial, the appointment of Joshua to take his place. And then we will move into what are known as the historical books, beginning with the book of Joshua. But before we get into today's conversation, it's important to say just a little bit about this book of Deuteronomy, because, you know, one thing about Deuteronomy is there's nothing new there. It's all been said before. There's nothing revolutionary. It is simply a collection of the final sermons of Moses. It's the final review before the big exam. When they cross the river, they get into the promised land, and they have to prove that it works. It is, in its essence, a book of remembrance, telling the people of this nascent nation to remember and never forget, to remind themselves frequently that the formula for ultimate success will always be faith plus obedience equals the favor and blessing of God. That's the story of Deuteronomy. The inverse of that is that failure to apply the formula in their own hearts and lives will lead directly to the absence of God's favor and blessing and will bring on a cycle of failure and judgment. This collection of the sermons of Moses is actually foundational to so much that follows in the remainder of the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. And it's foundational to our lives as well. It's of interest to note that the, the incredible number of times that, that the New Testament references the book of Deuteronomy. In Matthew 4, when Satan tempts Jesus and the Lord shoots back quotations, he talks, he brings his quotations out of Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 6. In Matthew 22, when Jesus is asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? He jumps back to Deuteronomy 6. The messianic prophecy of Deuteronomy 18 is referenced twice by Luke in the book of Acts, both the third and seventh chapters. In all the New Testament writers, they reference the book of Deuteronomy nearly a hundred times. It's so incredibly important as foundation to what we see as the gospel. So as we come to this week's conversation, I've chosen to give it the title, The Fear Factor. Now, I really wanted to preach from Deuteronomy 28. Ever since this series started, I've been looking forward to preaching from Deuteronomy 28. Obey and be blessed. I can do that. I can preach. I, can't obe I have a hard time with the obedience, but I, it's an easy one to preach. And I really want to, but then I realized there's more to it than obedience. There's a factor that plays out in our lives. It will either cause, that one factor will either cause our failure or our success. One thing. And it's not obedience and disobedience. It's fear. Fear, <laughs> fear can be good. Fear, the right fear, is good. And today I hope to convince you to embrace, experience, and enjoy fear. It's healthy. It's good. It's essential to success. And I know some of you are shaking your heads and wondering, hey, Babu, where are you going with this? You know, what are you doing? So before you switch off your head, let me acknowledge there are different kinds of fear, negative and positive. There are any number of situations where profound fear becomes an actual impediment to activity and may lead to a clinical diagnosis where they will say, you have a phobia. I used to accuse Coco of having a technophobia. I pushed her into computers, kicking and screaming. And there was a period of time in our life when she would say, OK, honey, I'm ready to write. Would you please come turn the computer on? 
I would come turn it on. She would say, would you open that letter I was writing the other day, or would you open that, that book I was writing? I'd, I'd open it and say, and then she'd say, honey, I've been working for a while. Would you come save it, please? She's gotten good. Now I'm trying to jack, I'm trying to jerk her out of PCs and into Apple, and it's, it's, it's a, there's some stress there. <laughs> but negative fear. You know, th there's so many, many kinds of, of, of phobias. I, I looked up, I looked up one, phobialist.com. There's a list. There is ablutophobia. It's a fear of bathing. <laughs> Sinophobia, a fear of dogs. Now, if you come to our house and you stop at the gate because the sign says Umbum Kali, it's a lie. <laughs> I didn't put the sign there, but I'm sinning by omission. I'm not taking the sign down. Actually, the dog that was there, the sign should have said, um, um, pole, nam vivu pia. <laughs> it should have said, this dog is, is uh, shy, humble, and lazy. <laughs> now, I could just put up Ame Shakufa, you know, he's dead. <laughs> but let's leave the sign alone, okay? And then, of course, there's technophobia. And a list of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. You know, anyway, we won't go there. But negative fear can be incredibly disruptive in our lives, and, and, and many of us have stuff that we're afraid of. You saw me frightened last Sunday on this stage. I thought I had lost my hearing aids. Now, I've already taken them out. They were in the bag, okay, because he's... the. PA system up here causes them to ring a bit. So, uh, But I took them out last week, dropped them in my shirt pocket, didn't know there was a hole in the pocket, and the next thing I know, they're gone. And I'm terrified. Uh, I was afraid of several things. I feared finding, finding them crushed on the floor. I feared the cost of replacement. And yeah, I feared telling Coco that I had lost them. <laughs> Thankfully, we found them, and thanks to those of you who, who helped look for them and all of you who are patient in the process and all of you who are concerned for my peace of mind and my hearing. So there are times my, my head runs on two tracks or more. And uh, last Sunday, as I began to share with you, I was trying to concentrate on what I wanted to say, what I needed to say on the conversation, but another track in my head was focused on the loss of those hearing aids. My fear was real. But the Holy Spirit brought to my mind the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 1.7, where Paul tells Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And I memorized it in different translations. The NIV says self-discipline, so we'll go with that. I, I like sound of some mind better, but that's a different translation. But once I was able to shut down the worry track, I could focus on what I was here to do. You know, at one point last year, I told you I think there are different classes of Christians, just as there are different classes of seating in air travel. One of the few reasons I would really like to be wealthy is I would never want to fly economy again, especially the prices. When I buy the cheapest ticket, they put me way back in the back, and, uh, you know, I don't want to do that. But as there are different classes of travel, I think there are different classes of Christians. I'm not going to go through all that today. But in that idea, in that metaphor, we all reach the same destination. But we have different levels of enjoyment on the journey. Uh, there's a third-class train passenger in, say, uh, it used to happen in Tanzania. It doesn't happen anymore because the trains don't run that much anymore. Uh, but back when the trains did run regularly, uh, they were always overloaded. And third class would sometimes find themselves hanging onto the roof of the train. And uh, all they had to do was they had a ticket that gave them a right to get someplace on the train and hold on for dear life. And, uh, or they might have a seat, but they would share it with six other people. And uh, th then others, you know, were more comfortable in a private compartment all that. But that was the classes of train journey. And so, too, there's people who follow in Christ, and those, of those, those who are 
following Christ, who have chosen to follow Christ because of a fear of hell, they're not having any fun on the journey. They're holding on for dear life. You know, they're afraid they're going to slip and fall right into hell. You know, and so they're, help me God, help me God. You know, and, and then there are those, the first class Christians are those who, whose response is, why are you a Christian? Well, I'm a Christian because God loved me. Gave, Jesus gave his life to die for me, and I just want to love him back. They're having a ball on the journey. Yeah, there is heaven waiting for all of us, but some of us are having more fun on the journey than others. But fear will get a person saved. But it's hard for fear to keep a person saved. But we can really say there's a negative fear and a positive fear. A fear of stuff inhibits us, inhibits us and is a negative influence on our pattern of living. When the phrase fear God refers to an awesome regard and loving respect for divine, it refers to an attitude of life that exerts a deeply positive influence on every aspect of our lives. And friends, that is the key to spiritual and living success. If we truly fear God, and we're going to see some passages relating to that in just a few minutes, if we truly fear God, meaning if we hold him in high reverence and respect, if we can truly, with all of our heart, lift our hands and sing, Oh, Lord, my God. I'm not going to sing it. Okay? Oh, Lord, my God. You know, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. When I, you know, when I survey, you know, the awesome wonder. You know, all that, I don't remember all the words, but, but as the praise band started to sing that this morning, my heart erupted in reverence and respect and celebration of his love for us. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, Moses tells us, and we've just read it, their hearts, that, oh, this is God speaking to Moses, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always. So, they might, so it might go well with them and with their children forever. Then in the next chapter, Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 to 7, these are the commands decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may Increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel. You know, I, I just imagine Moses standing there and shouting at the top of his voice, Hear, O Israel! Then the repeaters out through the crowd. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today. See, he's talking this like he believes it. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and when you go to your expo group. No, he didn't say that. You know, the fear of God has been grossly misunderstood by many people. In fact, one of the greatest men in the history of, well, the history of the Western church, really, was a German priest named Martin Luther. Martin Luther is a young man, is a young Catholic novice priest. Almost hated God because he was so afraid of him. He saw God as a as as a vengeful, uh, 
ogre looking down and saying, watching and seeing who did wrong and ha! Ha! The hell with you! That's how he saw God. Harsh in judgment. And then one day Martin Luther realized that the just will live by faith. And his life was revolutionized, and Western Christianity was forever changed. Catholicism was divided. The Reformation began and with speed and fervor, and across Europe, fires began to burn of Reformation and revival. But had Martin Luther seen a psychologist today, at that point when he was so consumed with fear, he would have been diagnosed as having theophobia, an incapacitating fear of the divine. So it was so intense, he nearly, he nearly grew to hate God. His view, his picture of God was distorted. And he could only envision God as a wrathful judge who would squash all who declined to obey. But in his search, he came to know, to respect, to honor, and yes, even fear God as the loving, merciful Father that he truly is. So when we say fear God, it doesn't mean to be afraid of him. It means to respect him, to honor him, to put him first. You know, some of us sometimes will obey God out of a sense of obligation. We'll say, well, you know, I can't commit adultery because, you know, I, I, can't, I can't deceive my boss. I can't lie because, mm, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't cheat on my taxes because, mm, you know. And, and so we do those things and we say we're obeying God, but we're doing it. It's kind of like the story of the little boy whose teacher, the little boy was very active, and, and I've got a grandson like that, and, uh, and the teacher kept having a hard time controlling him. The little boy wouldn't sit down. The teacher said, Johnny, sit down. And Johnny just keeps you know, looking around, standing up, looking at the butterflies. And the teacher says, Johnny, sit down. Johnny. Uh-huh. And finally the teacher says, Johnny. No. Johnny Matthew Wilson, sit down. And he leans over to his buddy. He says, I'm sitting down on the inside. But on the outside, I'm sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up. That's how some of us obey God. We do it because we have to, but we don't do it out of respect and reverence for him. We don't do it out of of a, a, a being in awe of his holiness and his love. So it's important to note that The fear of God is an awesome respect or reverence growing out of the majesty and greatness and power that we sang about this morning. To revere God as we should, it's critical that we understand his nature. And I don't think anything really clarifies that as well as the 37th chapter of Job. And no, I'm not going to read that to you this morning, but I would like you to read it yourself this afternoon or this evening. In fact, it's going to be be on the list of takeaways. Um... But the 37th chapter of Job, it's a good place to get a serious introduction to the very awesomeness of God. You know, it's really difficult to deny the awesome majesty of God when you hold your baby, or for a small minority in the house today who are older, your grandbaby, in your arms for the first time, and you hold this little one, You see this tiny but perfectly formed person. You've got this child right here. It's filling your two hands. You're holding. And that child looks up at you and smiles. You think it's smiling. It's really just gas. (laughs) Hasn't learned to really smile yet. But you react so positively to that expression, and it, it, it learns to smile from your reaction to its facial expressions. But it's hard to deny the awesomeness of, of the creative power of God when you see that tiny, perfect person, or when you lay on your back on the beach at 1 o'clock in the morning, far from the city, or out in the middle of the Sahara Desert, And you lie back and you look 
at a million, million, million stars spread as a blanket across the sky, put there every one individually by God himself. Hard to deny his awesomeness. Or when you t put your head beneath the surface of the Indian Ocean and you look at the incredible diversity of life, or you stand in the, in the, in the viewing box of a tour van or a four by four in the middle of the Serengeti or the Mara, and you watch thousands of wildebeest and zebra flow by you in the great migration. When I have those kind of experiences, all I want to do is sing how great thou art. The Arthur Seuss Lewis portrays the awesome majesty of God so well in, in the way in which he presents Aslan as a picture or metaphor of Christ. Awesome and fearsome in power, but, in the very, but so very good in his nature. You know, there is a tendency today in the modern church to treat God and Christ too lightly and casually. Say, yes, I'll receive Christ as one more, one more part of my religious package. Yes, I, I, I'll admit that God is, and, you know, so is, and so is, and, and uh, you know, and there are many ways to God. We become too casual. We will call on him when we think we need him. You know, oh God, help me now. You know, or Jesus, if you're going to come anytime soon, now would be good. You know, and, uh, yeah. So we call on him when we think we need him. We sing his music on Sundays, and the rest of the week we sing someone else's music. We give him a couple hours on Sunday morning and assume the rest of the week belongs to us. You know, the third commandment tells us not to take God's name in vain. Now, I was taught as a child that meant do not curse. Do not. In the American military, where I served a very long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, language would get pretty rough. We called it salty. And hearing it over those years that I wore the uniform generated a constant tension in my spirit. There was a friend of mine from college who joined the Navy about the same time I did, except he had gone to Officer Kennedy School and he was commissioned, and I wasn't. That uh, he had the desk, I had the mop. But uh, he stayed in the Navy for a career. He did well. We got out of touch and were reunited at a college reunion function just after he earned his first star and became an admiral. And that evening, we just were chatting. And uh, I asked him, by then I'm, I was in ministry and I was actually already a missionary at that point. And I asked him how he dealt with the language problem in the military. He laughed. He said as a young junior officer, he had to pray the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi many times where Francis prayed for grace to live with things he could not change. But then the day came when he got his first command. And then he prayed for wisdom and courage to change the things he could. And his first day on the bridge of the first ship he ever commanded, the language was normal until he heard somebody say Jesus. He turned and said, oh, you know him too. It's my friend. It's also my savior. Good going. He said it put a crimp on conversation because the CO let it very gracefully, very graciously let it be known that the name of God and the name of Jesus were to be respected on the bridge of his ship and in the, in the dining spaces and on the decks. He said, until he learned to speak English again, it really made a difference.
This idea of taking the name of the Lord your God in vain means more than just using those names in a perverted way. It also means speaking them loosely or lightly or irreverently, or even thinking about them one way. There's a vast difference between saying Jesus is our friend and treating him like our good buddy. He's really not interested in our jokes. He's our friend. He's our Savior. He's also our Lord. And our motivation to hold that which is holy in high respect, but to have a fear of God will only grow out of an understanding of who God is. Because it is through understanding of the character and attributes of God that we will become motivated toward respect and reference. I hope, I believe, that many of you, I hope all of you, will join us in our concerted reading of the Bible. That uh, we're finishing up Deuteronomy tomorrow, starting with Joshua. By the way, the blog, uh, Jimmy Abrams, is writing the blog, contributing the blog for Joshua. And uh, I've looked at it. I'm amazed. I'm thrilled. In fact, I wrote him when I read what he had to say. And I I read and I said, you know, I'm I'm tempted towards jealousy. If this, how you write, is anything like the way you preach, I want to sit in your church and be fed. So I, I hope you're part of this as we're reading because in our reading, I'm encouraging you to take note of what you read regarding the character of God. We're trying to highlight those in the blogs. But today there are seven things I want us to consider about the fear of God. First of all, fear of God is commanded. It's amazing how many times it's mentioned and even encouraged. And we're going to look at a few today. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord... This is again, back in the sermons of Moses. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Psalm 38, 8, 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Second, the fear of the Lord gives wisdom. We began with that passage from Proverbs 1.7, which shows the source of truly godly wisdom. I'd like to touch it at least once again this morning. Here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Solomon then goes on to describe the utter waste of our lives if we reject God, that if we refuse to fear him. We, in fact, cut our, if we refuse to fear him, we cut ourselves off from our only source of wisdom. We may be wise in our own eyes, but we're foolish, trusting a twisted perspective if we do not fear the Lord. But Solomon closes that passage with a hope. Verse 33, but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. And this is actually saying what wisdom, what God is saying to us, whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Third, the fear of the Lord. Third, the fear of the Lord will prevent sinful behavior. When we revere the Lord, we will keep ourselves from sin. Proverbs 16.6, Solomon says, through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. There's an incredible story in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts of how God demonstrated his power in response to sinful, disrespectful, abusive behavior. And how God's reaction brought change in the lives of many. A couple, man and wife, who we know only as Ananias and Sapphira. They went down in the history books because of a stunt they pulled. People were giving gifts to the church towards helping the church 
to serve the poor in Jerusalem. And one brother had sold a piece of land, and he had brought the entire proceeds to the church leaders, to Peter and the rest of them, and he had brought them the entire proceeds of the sale of the property. He said, here, use this however you see fit. Like we put our ties in the basket. But the story got around about what this brother had done. And they were, he was respected. People were saying, oh, did you see what he did? You know, wow, that's wonderful. That's incredible. I'm saying, you know, we could do something like that. You know, we got this piece of land we don't need. Let's, let's sell it. And, and uh, so they did. And then they had all the money. And they said, eh. ooh. Church doesn't need all this. So they took some aside. They, they were right. They, they had that right. It was theirs. But when Ananias goes and presents it to Peter and the other leaders, he said, uh, and Sapphira and I decided to sell that piece of land over on the south side of town, and, and uh, you know, we just know you all need money, and, and we just want to help, and so here's the proceeds. Peter didn't say thank you. Because Peter, through the, through the gift of the Holy Spirit of discernment, he realized that Ananias was being deceitful. <laughs> and um, Ananias dropped dead. Oh, well, later, and the young men take him out and bury him. You know, no wake, no celebration, no honors, no obituary. They just bury him. Oh, later, Sapphira's trying to figure out why Ananias hasn't come home, and so she comes looking for him, and Peter asks her, and she, she gives the same lie. And she falls down dead. Wow. So what's happened? They behaved in a deceitful way, and they were struck down, not by Peter, but by God. And Acts 5.11 says, great fear came upon the whole church, a fear of God. And God was highly honored. Change happened. People were transformed. And the church grew. This was one of those times when God stepped in to take corrective action within the body of Christ in order to correct an issue and get people's attention. Now, please, please, let's never get to the position where he has to do that among us. Amen? I, one, I don't want to explain that one to the police. Uh, I don't want to bury anybody because that happened. And uh, I, I sure, you know, let's don't go, let's, let's stay within the fear of God. The writer to the Hebrews makes another reference to Deuteronomy chapter 424 in Hebrews 12, 28, where he urges us, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. There's a dangerous assumption in many parts of the church world today. The assumption is that this grace that we receive gives us license to misbehave. I have literally in accosting people as a church leader, as I, I used to be a bishop. I'm, I'm not anymore. Okay. I was defrocked. Actually, some, in, in our church, you may be, in, in Africa, we do use the term bishop, and, uh, but it's a term of office, and when you're no longer in that office, you're no longer a bishop. Okay, so I'm an ex-bishop. Uh, but... Uh, I was a bishop in the church among the Maasai for about eight years. And uh, there were times that I would have to confront people about their behavior. And I remember vividly a, a pastor who we became aware that there was immorality in his life. And as I was talking with him, and he finally admitted it, I raised the question about HIV AIDS. He said, oh, God won't let that happen. He said, I'm a pastor. 
You might be a pastor, but you're also a reprobate. And you have put yourself outside the blessing and protection of God by your sinful behavior. He says, oh, no, God's already forgiven me. I said, when was the last time you had sex with her? He said, last night. I said, when did God forgive you? He said, last week. No, there is this idea in the church world today, this misconception that grace is licensed to sin. Not so. No way. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Life is not monopoly. Friend, if you've received Christ, his blood does cover your past, your present, your future, but grace is never a license for behavior outside the plan of God for your life. That is called sin. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6, 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that... Technology is driving me nuts. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in, death like, like, in a death like his, we will certainly also be, reunited, be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. My friend, the fear of God, number four, the fear of God will get us through the hard times. Job was asked, is not the fear of God your confidence? God, who has limitless might, welcomes our prayers and cares about our hurts. We need not fear the future, for we know the one who holds the future. The awesomeness of God is our confidence. Five, the fear of God affects life itself. We see the words of Solomon in Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. The prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. The way of the Lord is a refuge for the blameless, but it's ruin to those who do evil. And in Proverbs 14, 26, Solomon again writes, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a foundation of life, turning a person from the snare of death. And in Proverbs 22, verse 4, Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Solomon's father, King David, put it this way in Psalms 34. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. The fear of God is essential for leaders in Exodus 18. Moses gives a prerequisite for leaders that they should fear God. Those entrusted with government authority are warned in Psalms 2, verses 10 through 11. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Finally, the seventh one. The fear of God results in answered prayer. Psalms 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. So my friend, here's the question. Does our life and does our prayer time demonstrate reverence for him? The 
does our life, and does our prayer time, demonstrate reverence? Do we demonstrate by our life and even by our conversations with him regard for his awesomeness? Do we, in fact, fear him? The fear of God is the one fear that removes all others. As we walk with God, as we trust him, as we cast all our cares upon him, we can become fearless of everything and everyone but him. There was a point several years ago, just after the genocide in Rwanda, Merle and I had just moved to Kigali, and I was asked to go and do a seminar in a distant part of the country. Well, nothing's very distant in Rwanda. It's not a very big place, but it's not like you can't drive for days in Rwanda, and if you do, you're in another country. But uh, I went to visit with the security officer at the embassy, and uh, I asked about security in that one location, and she said, I don't know, maybe I've told you this story before, but anyway, she said, I just wish you missionaries would leave and go away and let us settle this and then come back and do your thing. And she had pushed too many of the wrong buttons for me at that point. And I sat back and I said, you know, I, I said, uh, you're not going to solve this because it's not a socioeconomic problem. It's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem, and you don't have the answer. Jesus is the answer. And she says, well, well, at least promise me that unless it's an emergency, you'll stay in the city. I said, no problem. I'll stay in the city unless it's an emergency. She's good. She's, you know, so many missionaries are so irrational. You know, and she said, but I, I'm glad you understand. I said, well, there's one thing you have to understand. People dying and going to hell constitutes an emergency. And whether I live or die is not of consequence. There's more to the story, but we'll stop there. But when it comes to preaching the gospel and to sharing Christ with people, Honestly, I have no fear. There are things I'm afraid of. I will not ride roller coasters. I will not bungee jump. I know that heavier men than I have gone off the bridge at Victoria Falls. I know that. But I know that if they tie me to that system, I know the rubber band will break. <laughs> I know that thousands have ridden the roller coaster at Six Flags but I won't get on it because I know if I'm on it, that's the day it's going to come off the track. And I don't need that kind of fear in my life. But the things that would stop us from doing what God... Now, if God tells me, get on the roller coaster and tell somebody about Jesus while you're riding, okay. I, ride on, I ride on antique Russian airplanes, you know, that were sold for junk by the Soviet Union and were bought by somebody to start a new airline in Africa, and I, I ride on the planes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so where I need to go, God takes care of the fear factor. Because as, as we fear him, we can become fearless of everything and everyone but him. Jesus had these words for his disciples 2,000 years ago, and for you and I, his disciples today, in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you to you as the world gives it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let me remind you one more time of Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7. He explained that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-discipline. David looks back on his own life experience and wrote about it in the 23rd Psalm, which we all love so well and reverence, and, and he talks about freedom from fear and reverence. You stand with me? 
And could we read it together as we close? The Lord, read it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, be beside the quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, thank you. that We can call you Father. Thank you that you build us in a way that we can respect you, we can honor you, we can love you, and we can demonstrate all of that through the lives we live of obedience to your will in our lives. We can walk free from sin. We can walk free from fear of the world and all the world will throw at us. We have liberty in Jesus because of you, and we rejoice in that today. Father, if there's anybody in this place today for whom this has sounded awful strange, Father, I pray that you would touch their heart and draw them to yourself. Grow yourself in each one of us this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're not quite done yet. Takeaways. Coco's not here. Sorry. So I'm doing this. I think she's going to speak next Sunday. Uh, just before she takes off again. Uh, but uh, this week, even today, I would love for you to read the 37th chapter of Job, and spend some time reflecting on the utter awesomeness of God. And be prepared to share your thoughts in Expo this week. Would you do that? Second, list several things that you're afraid of. Things that frighten you. How might you apply one or more of the seven points shared today about the fear of God to deal with those fears? Third, would you be better prepared to deal with those issues now? Why? Number four, what can you do to evidence the fear of God in your life now? Make a plan. Make a plan to do it. To demonstrate the fear of God in your life. And ask your expo group to pray with you for success have an awesome, awesome week in the great grace and power of our awesome God. Amen? Amen.